here, and we will be sure to address them. Uh, that being said, on behalf of the production team today, I'd like to hand it over to Devi Ramkusun, who is an EMD market system specialist and will be the moderator for today's session. Devi, over to you. Thanks, Janina. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our MarketLinks webinar on advancing inclusive, sustainable, and resilient economic growth through enterprise-driven development. My name is Devi Ramkusun, and I am the market system specialist with the Center for Economics and Market Development in USAID's Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation. Earlier this year, USAID released our updated economic growth policy, which reviews emerging trends and offers six new principles for our programming to advance our enterprise-driven development approach. Throughout this month on Market Links, we are reviewing these principles and the ways in which the policy helps USAID address constraints related to market and governance failures, lack of inclusion, and environmental sustainability. As USAID Administrator Power noted in her remarks before the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, there are inextricable linkages between political freedom and broad-based economic growth. To introduce the discussion and how we can all incorporate these principles of the economic growth policy into our programming, I have the great honor of welcoming USAID Counselor Chris Milligan. Counselor Milligan is the highest serving Foreign Service Officer at the agency and has previously served as the Acting Mission Director for USAID Madagascar. He joined USAID as a Presidential Management Fellow in 1990 and has a bachelor's degree from Georgetown, Georgetown School of Foreign Service and a master's degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and is a distinguished graduate of the National War College. Councillor Milligan, over to you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome and hello to everybody joining us for today's event. I really appreciate how our virtual platform allows many of our overseas colleagues and friends to join us here today as well. I especially want to thank USAID Center for Economics and Market Development and the Market Links team for organizing this event. I'm pleased to welcome this panel of experts from USAID and our partner community who will dive deeper into the principles behind USAID's economic growth policy and how we can incorporate this guidance into our programming. Uh, as Debbie noted, I joined USAID over 30 years ago, and I joined as a private enterprise officer with a focus on financing for low-income housing. So this policy represents something that I've seen USAID do well time and time again, which is improve our program guidance, guidance based on new data and on the realities of the changing development landscape. This new economic growth policy updates the previous document from 2008 with recent topics and with the latest evidence in economic development, including new considerations on priorities such as COVID-19 and fragile states, gender, trade, and, and, and poverty. It provides our staff and partners with new information to do the following. First, work with the private sector to drive growth and increase productivity and the use of techniques to strengthen market and governance systems in partner countries. Secondly, focus on the inclusion of women and other marginalized groups in economic growth. And finally, build resilience and work with partner countries on planning for long-term recovery from economic shocks. The COVID-19 pandemic has opened the world's eyes to how deeply our health and economies are connected. And as Debbie mentioned, uh, the administrator recently testified before Congress, and she also noted that the investments that US, the United States makes in our partner countries are in fact investments in our own US security. You know and I know there are also investments in our middle class. Economically healthy countries make for better security and trading partners. They help create better, stronger, and more resilient markets for US exports and support our own workers. For example, over the past 10 years, almost two thirds of the growth in US exports went to major USAID partners. On average, 
Each additional dollar invested by USAID in trade capacity building programs is associated with a $42 increase in a, in a given country's exports two years later. The increased demand in our partner countries also creates US jobs. For example, the number of American jobs created by exports of US goods and services to Indonesia nearly doubled in the 10 year period up to 2015. But this benefit to the American people is only part of what this policy aims to achieve. The foundation of this new guidance is rooted in promoting inclusive, sustained, and resilient economic growth. In areas of mental health, connectivity and belonging, job security and physical health, women in emerging economies have greater challenges and are experiencing them more acutely than workers in developed economies. Another truth that COVID-19 pandemic has shown us is how the effects of the pandemic, both at work and at home, have been far worse for women in emerging economies. Prior to the pandemic in 2019, almost one third of female youth worldwide were already not involved in education, employment, or training. Young women were more than twice as likely as young men to be jobless and not in education nor training. Even here in the United States, it has been reported that more than 2 million women left the labor force in 2020, and women are now at the lowest workforce participation level since uh, 1988. USAID's economic growth policy makes it clear that if the social and legal barriers that prevent women from participating in the formal workforce and opening their own businesses, if, if these barriers are eliminated, we will see massive economic gains. The world has certainly changed a lot since I first joined USAID more than 30 years ago. We're also now in a very unique moment. Or as President Biden called it in his address to the joint session of Congress, an inflection point. The inflection point is one in which ambitious authoritarian regimes are seeking to reshape the geopolitical and economic order. In seeking to create a world more like themselves, a lot is at stake and there are big consequences. So many questions are being asked now and there are different models out there. The question now is who will set the international standards for the 21st century, the norms for information use and access for what is defined as rule of law? What is even good social behavior? Ultimately, what is the relationship between the private sector and government, and even more fundamentally between citizen and state? USAID's enterprise-driven development model and the principles behind the economic growth policy enable our partners to take ownership of their development processes and participate in the world economy to address global challenges as equals. Our partnerships well, they're the source of our strength. We are more effective when we work together with the private sector, local stakeholders, donors, and other governments. USAID is ready to lead the global response to multiple crises that we face today, including the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and threats to democracy and human rights. Our foreign assistance helps build a safer, more prosperous world, which in turn, as you know, leads to a safer, more prosperous America. I encourage everyone joining us today to read the policy. I see that many of you have in the chat box. And I, apply, and I encourage you to apply its principles because ultimately we all benefit when USAID invests in programs that promotes inclusive, resilient, and sustainable economic growth. Thank you and, and back to you, Debbie. Thank you, Councillor Milligan, for sharing your insights about the economic growth policy. We'll now have a chance to hear from some of our principal authors of the policy, including Robin Broughton, who's the director, William Butterfield, entrepreneurial environment team lead, and Nathan Martinez, the economics team lead, all of whom sit within the Center for Economics and Market Development with at USAID. We'll also hear from industry leaders on the practical implications of applying the policy. They are Louise Fox, a non-resident senior fellow 
for Global Economy and Development within the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institute, and also the former USAID Chief Economist, Liz Ellis, the CEO of IDE Global, and David Snellbecker, the CEO of International Development Group. I'll now turn it over to Robin, who will share an overview of the policy. Robin, over to you. Thanks, Councilor Milligan, for your support of the economic growth policy and the EG community. And thanks to Davy and Market Links for hosting this today. I only have five minutes, so I'm gonna jump right in. Um, just put the slides up, please. Thank you. Next slide. I won't go into the real details, but I wanted to share our long process just to underscore, we took a staff led ground up, extremely collaborative approach to drafting the economic growth policy. We wanna thank you, the partner community for the thorough review of the policy on our original draft. You reminded us the importance of really diving into resilience and also inspired us to further build out our gender sections among other things. We really appreciate your fresh eyes and deep insights, so thank you. As for the process, we started with a technical review to make sure we were delivering the latest thinking and truly taking a cross-cutting approach. From there, we drafted an outline and built out a first draft. After we presented it, incorporated feedback on several drafts, we put it out for internal review, external review, and clearance and launched in January of this year. Now, as we are rolling it out, we are also working on supplemental guidance to accompany it, both to support the field and ensure we are working closely with our technical colleagues in education, DRG, agriculture, and many other key sectors. Look for more information on that as we release it on market links. Next slide. I just wanna highlight some of the core topics covered in the policy. The first is that firm level productivity drives economic growth. This is consistent with USAID's 2008 economic growth policy and updates the model to advance the enterprise driven approach. Basically, while firm level productivity drives growth, Productivity in turn is driven by human capital and technology. It's firms that then use human capital and technology to drive productivity growth. This is also in line with the USAID private sector engagement strategy. Second is that sound governance enables economic growth. So firm productivity is the driver and good governance is the enabler. The document looks specifically at how to address administrative failures, mainly service delivery breakdown. The policy also looks at the broader political economy and institutional issues involved in economic development, focusing on incentives for competition and public good provisions. Next, understanding economic growth takes place in complex market systems. With all the interdependencies, there are a lot of cause and effects of growth, so it's very difficult to determine constraints to growth. However, we think we can categorize these into four main areas, market failures, poor governance, lack of inclusion, and environmental sustainability. Countries with poorly functioning market systems, ineffective governance, higher level of inequality, and poor management of the environment will all face slower and less sustainable economic growth, which is what we want to avoid. Next slide. The policy offers six new principles for impact. One, enable partners to be self-financing. The key here is to build efficient and competitive markets for the private sector and strengthen civil society capacity to raise their own resources. We need to ensure our interventions generate additional financial resources for local partners to continue to meet objectives of our program. It is critical that we look at sources of financing and revenue that we wanna target. Two, prioritize inclusion, sustainability, and resilience. Our programs need to be very sensitive to who we are benefiting. Activities should target the poorest and most vulnerable sections of society. Three, be systemic and catalytic. The policy advances a systems-based approach to understanding economic growth challenges. It states economic analysis is essential to understanding underlying economic and governance issues and how to affect them. We will have a greater impact if we systematically address market failures and improve ineffective governance, ultimately helping partner countries function. Four, be cost effective. We have a responsibility to the US taxpayer. We can't continue to just report results. We must de delineate by cost. We need to better understand our impact in terms of alternative uses of resources and the additionality of our programs. Cost effectiveness analysis and, and impact evaluation will help us do just that. Five, be adaptive. 
In line with Nobel laureate Michael Kramer, the policy elevates experimentation and learning as keys to success. Pilots are encouraged and failure is okay. Six, show benefit to the American people. We need to be mindful that US aid efforts do benefit American people and we must do a better job telling this story. The policy provides several examples of how USAID has helped open markets and created investment opportunities for US businesses, among other things. Economic growth leads to more stable countries, which is important for American national security. This is especially key now that USAID has a seat on the National Security Council. Next slide. Finally, the keys to the success of our policy. If we follow the steps laid out in the economic growth policy, we will continue to strengthen our partnerships and we'll be able to better demonstrate our advantages as a partner. To measure the success of implementation of the, economic, of the policy to economic growth programming, we have set two bold targets. We aim to increase the use of both economic analysis, economic analysis and cost effectiveness analysis. Our goal is that 75% of programming should be underpinned by analysis by 2026. Hopefully with support and ideas from you, our partners, we will get there. Thanks again for hosting us today. I'm excited to hear from our panelists. So back to you, Davey. Thanks so much, Robin, for sharing the consultative process of how this policy came to be. Now, I'm really excited to hear what our esteemed panelists have to say about its application. So I'm gonna first turn it over to Bill. Um, Bill, we've heard a lot about the enterprise-driven development approach within the EG policy. Why is USAID so focused on enterprises as drivers of growth? Thanks, Davey. I uh, hope you can all hear me. Uh, yeah, so I really liked what uh, Councilor Milligan had to say. And I just want to second that. Is that you know, I think that the, what the U.S. needs is a compelling model uh, of economic development to offer developing countries. Uh, and I think that the enterprise-driven development approach uh, is going to be part of that larger effort in the global competition of, uh, of ideas. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think that this is, it's really going to be important for us to be able to explain this model uh, to our partners, uh, particularly our partners uh, in uh, the governments, uh, in the countries where we work, uh, our um, government sector and, and leaders in the countries where we work. Uh, so as Robin was saying, you know, while a lot has changed uh, in this new policy, a lot, a lot of states, a lot has stayed the same. Uh, USAID believes that development is enterprise driven. Uh, because economic growth uh, is driven by productivity and productivity takes place at the level of enterprises. Now by enterprises, we mean, we mean not just private enterprises. I think it's mostly private enterprises that drive this, uh, that drive productivity growth, uh, but it's also firms and farms of all sizes. I think it includes NGOs. Uh, I think it also includes publicly owned enterprises. I think you can see that as well. Um, so we take a very broad view of what an enterprise means. Uh, so let me focus on, you know, what is different. We still believe that, again, it's productivity growth that takes place at the level of enterprise, driven by saving and investment in human capital and technology. Um, and that I think it's very much consistent with the OA paper. Um, I think what's different, uh, again, Robin, as, as Robin also alluded to, is the systems-based approach. Um, so instead of drivers and enablers being viewed as separate concepts, where if you can just get them right, then growth will kind of automatically follow. Our new approach models them as more like two sides of the same coin, uh, supply and demand, uh, if you will. So all the variables in the system are interdependent with growth, uh, not separate from growth. Uh, so improvements in one area, for example, uh, can feed in and spill over to other sectors of the economy, which can result in a virtuous cycle of growth, a growth acceleration, uh, which, which are fantastic, which are great, you know, which really uh, alleviate poverty quickly. Um, but constraints in one sector of the economy or in one area can spill over uh, and result in systematically lower growth or an equilibrium of low growth. Uh, so, uh, you know, growth tends to be very state dependent and is very inter it's very uh, dependent uh, on a lot of different variables, as we know. So it's very difficult to determine what is a cause of growth, uh, what's an effect of growth, and again, what are merely symptoms of low growth and low demand within the system. 
So for example, I mean, we can talk about, you know, is this or that aspect of poor governance causing low growth or is low investment and low demand causing poor governance? Uh, I, I think it's really hard to know. Um, I think we have a very good idea of what the long run fundamentals of a good economy should look like. Um, but a lot of the time, those are just basically defining what it means to be a developed country, right? Uh, so uh, now long run fundamentals are very important. We should continue to help our partner countries get those right. But and the reality is, I don't think they really tell you much about the causes of short to medium run economic growth. And I don't think that we have one size fits all solutions uh, that can help accelerate short to medium run economic growth. And it's, and it's that kind of growth, that, that, that short to medium run economic growth, that's what our partner countries really care about it, really care about, I think. Uh, not necessarily getting the long run fundamentals right. Um, so this again is why I think economic analysis is so important, why we featured it in the EG policy. Uh, economic analysis is important because it helps us to identify the unique constraints to growth in the countries where we work. Um, let me focus, Robin covered those constraints, but let me focus on just one real, uh, very briefly. Market failures. So I think market failures are very important and understudied a lot in economic uh, development uh, because private investment generally requires complementary investments and significant levels of coordination. I think a lot of the time in the countries where we work, the private sector just isn't going to take on massive investment risks uh, needed to break economies out of low growth states. Uh, the social value of an investment can be very high, but private returns can be low or, or not captured. Um, oftentimes, I think what is needed is actually well-targeted public investment, uh, perhaps together with donor support uh, to crowd in the private sector uh, to get the ball rolling. Uh, so uh, real quickly, back to what enterprise-driven development is and isn't. So as you can see, it's not some laissez-faire approach to development where, you know, hands off and the private sector just goes. You know, that, that's, that's not what it is. And, and there's, there's been a little bit of confusion there. Um, Enterprise-driven development recognizes, and this new policy recognizes the prevalence of market failures uh, and the need to, have to build the state capability and capacity uh, to combat those. Um, but public investments need to be transparent and informed by democratic values. Uh, otherwise, they risk being ineffective, wasted, or falling into the hands uh, of a few elites. Uh, via you know, institutionalized corruption. Uh, and I think foreign assistance, if well-designed and targeted, uh, can help with this. We can support our, country, our partner countries to make the right investments needed to accelerate inclusive, sustainable, and resilient economic growth that they demand. And again, uh, in, in, uh, consistent with what uh, Councilor Milligan just said, um, this will be beneficial for US economic and security interests, as well as the US middle class. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Bill. That's a really interesting approach. But we also know that there are other critical issues such as climate change and resilience that USAID also needs to be incorporating into the larger policy. Louise, I wonder if you can share your insights on how we can do so. Hi, Louise, you might need to unmute your microphone. I just oh. unmuted, sorry. Uh, took me a minute to get that cursor over there. All right, um, hi everybody. And it's really great to uh, be back talking with people at USAID, I miss you. Um, and it's great to see some familiar faces and names. And so thanks everybody for coming and welcoming me um, this morning, at least it's morning my time. Um, okay, so in terms of your question, Debbie, a lot of people think you can't have you can't solve climate change, for example, or other pressing issues within a market based system. And that, I think, ignores the uh, a, a key point that Bill just talked about, which is that market in order for enterprise driven uh, growth to happen within market mechanisms, you need to um, control the externalities. Right. So um, market-based decisions, mar market-based resource allocation decisions by private actors might overlook sustainability issues that are important to the broader community and could damage their current and future welfare and future growth. 
So we know climate change is a perfect example of that. We know that if climate change is not mitigated and if, and if countries don't adapt to it, which is really what um, our partner countries have to do mostly, um, then uh, growth will not um, occur. And this is what uh, Bill talked about as externalities. So governments have to regulate the market behavior to raise the cost of these externalities to the market actors that cause them. This can include a straight out prohibition. For example, a prohibition against pollu uh, pollution and fines for polluters. It can also um, include a form of taxes, for example, that raise the price of carbon or lower the price of green uh, energy solutions. So, um, and USAID programs already support governments to do that, um, at, to lower their carbon footprint, including through reforestation, and adapt their infrastructure to future climate change and uncertainty. So this EG policy fits right in with all the rest uh, of the USAID policies that are designed to help uh, partner countries uh, grow and uh, develop their own middle class and be uh, self-sustaining. Now, the issue of resilience certainly has been coming up over the past year and a half or so uh, because the COVID-19 uh, pandemic showed us how important resilience is to sustainable economic growth and transformation. Now, the issue about resilience is that it inevitably involves some redundancy, you know, which may be a bit inefficient and markets hate inefficient. So one example of a redundancy is stockpiling health supplies, right, which might not be needed before they expire. That's kind of like paying insurance on your house and never having a fire. You, it, this was not a waste of money, right? Um, so. Uh, countries also, to get resilience, need to adapt their infrastructure to future climate um, uncertainties through re resilience. But the thing is, redundancy costs have to be imposed, and then market actors can supply the needed re redundancy. So that's where uh, Bill is talking about an effective government, a development-oriented state, and one that uh, it sort of discusses the choices and the trade-offs involved in becoming resilient uh, with its um, citizens so that everyone is involved um, in the question. And so an example, for example, of resiliency that USAID has supported is, worldwide, is trade in grains and trade in food. And trade in food can smoothly move supplies from excess supply areas to areas hit by drought if the right market infrastructure is there, including payment and logistics systems. And that's why, for example, USAID works uh, to help countries uh, improve their trade and logistics systems. So overall, sustainability is good development and resilience help, resiliency helps ensure sustainability. And I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Louise. So Louise and Bill helped us have a better understanding of the framework of the EG policy. And I think it's time now to dive a little bit deeper into the six principles themselves. So I was wondering if I could turn to David and ask you, how, um, how is your company contributing to a more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient economic growth development um, in the countries in which you work? Uh, so thank you very much. I wanted to focus on the first two principles of the strategy, um, self-reliant, self financing, self-reliance, and um, uh, inclu inclusivity, sustainability, and resilience. Um, I think that as countries are emerging from COVID-19 uh, and facing other development challenges, there are three big economic growth programming areas that uh, my company, International Development Group, is, is focusing on, and I think are important broadly for EG programming, uh, fiscal trade and jobs. And on the fiscal side, countries are really squeezed. They need to raise sufficient tax revenues, even increasing tax revenues uh, from a tax base that is shrinking because of the economic downturn of, of during COVID. And so that requires a focus on tax policy, tax administration and other revenue areas. At the same time, the expenditure needs are increasing because there's so much need 
after the economic uh, implications of COVID. And then squeezed in the middle, there's this enormous, there's this burgeoning debt burden. And um, the, the um, uh, private financing to developing countries has fallen maybe by $700 billion uh, last year, uh, according to the OECD from what it, what it could have been or should have been. And sovereign debt levels are up 12% in emerging markets and 8% in uh, low income countries. So some of our countries are approaching debt burdens. There's a, a debt service suspension initiative of the World Bank, uh, but that is maybe going to provide $5 billion of relief when countries face this year uh, over $350 billion of debt servicing uh, requirements just in the developing world. Um, and the debt situation in countries is different. Some countries just face a liquidity problem. Some countries face a, a more of an insolvency problem. Um, we're already talking under our Indo-Pacific Opportunities Project that we're imp implementing for USAID, where USAID uh, can, uh, missions can buy in with one country uh, about, uh, with one mission to provide advising and assessment on how to manage the debt burden, uh, particularly uh, the debt burden that's caused by um, infrastructure loans from, from, the, from China. Um, although I think that we have to go back in time to find a good model since USAID has not worked a lot in countries with huge uh, debt crises because we haven't seen that recently. So I wanted to give an example uh, all the way back from the 1990s. Uh, in 1997 and 1998, I worked in Ukraine on a USAID macro project uh, during the, as the Asian uh, financial crisis spread around the developing world. And we worked very closely with US Treasury. So uh, US Treasury was taking the lead in, um, in pushing the IMF and the World Bank to lend more and in pushing countries to consider debt forgiveness. But the USAID project uh, did a lot of work on fiscal calculations, understanding what the actual debt burden was, providing support behind the scenes for, uh, for, to ministries of finance, uh, particularly in meeting conditionality. And I think that's a really important model as a number, of our uh, a number of our partner countries are going to be experiencing uh, debt burdens uh, in the near term. That USA behind the scenes can provide uh, assistance, technical assistance yeah, and analytical assistance to ministries of finance and to US Treasury and communicate really closely with US Treasury, which would take the, the lead on the political front. Um, the second area I think is very important is, uh, is global trade, is supporting uh, international trade. International trade right now is politically sensitive, supporting liberalized trade is not very popular on either side of the aisle, but it's really critical because uh, international trade has fallen quite a lot during the pandemic. And uh, there's been a, a big uptick in trade of goods over the first quarter of 2021, but not really in the developing world. The Middle East, Africa, South America, South Asia, have not recovered to where they were pre-pandemic. And even East Asia has recovered, but that was because they were allowed to, they were able to uh, um, uh, reduce their restrictions after COVID. And now the situation is maybe changing and trade and, and services, particularly in tourism has not uh, recovered. This is a critical problem because, domestic, because countries don't have enough domestic demand uh, to generate economic recovery. It's gotta come from, from international uh, from international demand um, and to, and and um, trade facilitation I think is a partic particularly important area. I want to give uh, two examples of our projects in we're implementing the USAID Bangladesh uh, business enabling environment and uh, a trade and business enabling environment improvement project. Um, we are working with customs to reduce trade costs at customs points increase the use of authorized operators to transport goods across borders, build capacity for post-clearance audit, improve public education for small and medium traders, improve some software customs uses, improve training to, to customs officials uh, in customs valuations, improve food safety protections so that the, the costs of exporting agricultural products is, is lower. Um, and we're doing similar work on the Europe and Eurasia Edge project, uh, where, which is a, which is a buy-in project for uh, E&E countries. We're looking in particular at reducing the borders at one of the costs of trade 
at one border between Albania and North Macedonia. Uh, we've did a big assessment and our and our um, and have made a number of recommendations. And we're hoping to hold an event actually in July where we would highlight all of this and hopefully even have the U.S. ambassadors from North Macedonia and, and Albania meet at the border and highlight a lot of the challenges that we're working on. And we've also done a lot of assessments under the WTO trade facilitation agreement of, an, of a number of trade facilitation problems uh, in, the, in the 12 countries, looking at risk management, authorized operators, single window, cross-border agency cooperation, and some other areas. And we are couching all of this in the, in the international agreements that countries have made, the free trade agreement, uh, CEFTA, the Central European Free Trade Agreement, uh, European Union, a key is communautaire. So there are a number of areas uh, where countries have already made commitments and uh, to, to improve in trade facilitation. And we're providing the technical assistance. And often we're trying to do it on both sides of the border in two different countries, taking a, uh, taking a regional approach. I think that trade facilitation and working in this way, I think is a really good model for projects. Also focused on trade um, facilitation, which is really just reducing the cost of doing trade and is a little bit politically less sensitive. And then real quick, the third area I want to mention is focus on jobs. Um, so, and I think the broad idea of enterprise-driven uh, development is really important. And a key aspect of that is that enterprises create jobs. Without, without creating jobs, uh, economic growth isn't inclusive. It's when they create jobs across the board that economic growth is inclusive. And we've got to look at formal jobs, informal jobs, employment, the gig economy, agriculture, everything. And this needs to be not this needs to be a cross-cutting uh, focus of economic growth programming. So not just business enabling environment, but if you're working on domestic resource mobilization, you want to increase tax revenues. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that we're not increasing the burden on labor too much to, to reduce formal sector employment. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. I think what you said is really important as we think about COVID recovery and really key to how we're rolling out the EG policy uh, as, as uh, we emerge from COVID. Um, Liz, I also know that a number of our market links audience members come from an ag background, and I know that's where IDE works primarily. I wondered if you could help us think about how IDE is applying some of these principles as well from an ag sector in particular. Oh, Liz, I, I apologize, I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to start off by saying thanks for having us here. Um, we're really excited about the economic growth policy, and I want to share a little bit about principles two, three, four, and five quickly. Um, starting off, you know, at IDE, we're focused on powering entrepreneurs to end poverty. And we do that by helping to create and strengthen inclusive and resilient market ecosystems that grow and adapt to benefit everyone. So with principle number two, prioritize inclusion, sustainability, and resilience, um, we believe that to sustain impact over the long term, we have to ensure that economic ecosystems, local, national, uh, regional networks of market actors, which include households, entrepreneurs, businesses, and government agencies um, who are both competing and uh, cooperating with one another, um, that that is needed to be competitive, inclusive, and resilient. And those terms really define our focus. So competitiveness, we know, is important to making markets function and offering growth opportunities to those that they're intended to be benefit. And inclusiveness really ensures those benefits are incurred by everyone, especially the most poor and vulnerable and marginalized. And the third aspect, resilience, has really become the most important to IDE because without it, it's not possible to sustain competitiveness and inclusiveness. So we believe that the collective ability to plan across market actors can result from honest and mutually empowering relationships that not only keep a market functioning in challenging times, but fosters sustainability and um, mentoring to make markets work. 
On the second or the third principle, be a systemic or catalytic, this is really where resilience comes into play. And we're focused on creating resilient Marco ecosystems. And this has been refined over the past from our work in Nepal, um, specifically in farming, where we are building and sustaining access for whole communities by forming hubs of activities that we call resilient market ecosystems. And they're focused around community managed collection centers. And these are much more than just physical spaces for the collection of produce. They link households and farmers um, and input companies and buyers and processing companies and financial services, as well as public and private extension agents to create an opportunity for farming households to have access to a broad range of resources. And by virtue of that community managed structure, resilient market ecosystems help farmers raise their voices and to the local and the national government. It helps to empower women and vulnerable groups, helps to improve nutrition, reduce farming risk, diversify crops, and facilitate access to microfinance. Um, I think the other one of the questions in the comments was about how does WASH fit in as well? Um, we also use that approach under sanitation and marketing to create both the demand and the supply for the sale, private sector sale of latrines to poor rural households. And happy to chat more about that later. On principle number four, be cost effective. Um, cost effectiveness or return on investment is a core KPI for IDE. We're really excited to see this in the policy. Um, and this really goes back to our founding. Our founder, Paul Polek had a don't bother trilogy the first was, if you haven't talked to at least 100 customers in depth before you start, don't bother. If your product or service won't earn or save at least three times the customer's investment in the first year, don't bother. And if you can't sell 100 million of your product or service, don't bother. Um, with those principles in mind, we really apply that to ourselves and everything we do. And we measure for every dollar that we deploy around the world, how much are we generating an economic return for the clients we work with? Last year, our global average was $13.30 to one. And we think it's really important that we hold ourselves to that standard in all of our work. Um, so far, our measurements just at the household level, but we are looking increasingly expanding that to the resilient market ecosystem level because we know much greater impact is being created. And then finally, with the adaptive, I think this really goes to the heart of using human de centered design um, in all that we do. So starting with people, designing to context, using business as the vehicle to deliver impact, and then measuring and ensuring that the results at the end of the day are worth the investment that has been put in. Um, the next phase of this for us is we have created a market systems resilience index, which is really looking at that interplay between the household level resilience and the market system resilience and allows us to identify where are the areas that we can invest more in to help bring households back into a place of resiliency and growth. Um, I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Davey. Thanks so much, Liz. I really appreciate you sharing those thoughts. Um, you touched upon the importance of economic analysis, and I, that is one of the ways that the, we're looking to roll out the policy um, so that that analysis informs project design and implementation. Um, we also know that USAID has gone through a reorg recently, and I was wondering if I could turn it over to Nathan, who um, I'd love to hear from your thoughts on how uh, the new bureau, the Bureau for Development, Democracy and Innovation is supporting this goal, especially with respect to economic analysis. Thank you, Debbie, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, the Bureau uh, serves as USAID's leaders for technical assistance. This includes many analytic tools, uh, guidance documents and services that are managed out of several centers and hubs uh, within the Bureau. In fact, I would probably need about an hour or more just to talk through all of them, so I'll just cover uh, some of the key analyses that are mentioned in the economic growth policy. The first thing to note is that the Bureau's analyses and related services are delivered using several approaches to have the broadest impact. USAID civil and foreign service professionals often team up with implementing partners, local academics, and USAID mission staff to conduct analyses that inform country and sector level decisions. This includes studies, studies such as growth and jobs diagnostics to identify barriers to private investment, inclusivity, job creation, 
and systemic change. Political economy analysis, institutions analysis, and system-based approaches can be used to identify the root cause of these constraints. Uh, the incentive structure of various institutions and the best avenues to bring about change. Uh, the Bureau has also, also has screening and management tools for climate risk and environmental analysis. Um, as Luis pointed out, this is clearly an integral part of uh, USAID's economic growth uh, policy um, and the, the US government uh, writ large. Similar to the cost effectiveness measure, uh, measures mentioned by Liz, uh, the Bureau has several techniques to measure the cost effectiveness of individual projects and activities. This includes traditional cost effectiveness approaches, such as cost benefit and cost effectiveness analysis um, that can estimate the distribu distributional impact and sustainability of interventions. These approaches have also been adapted uh, to analyze specific sectors and issues. For example, the Bureau has cost analysis guidance for educational programs and guidelines for incorporating gender, resilience measures, and ecosystem services into cost benefit analysis. Impact evaluation and emerging approaches such as cash benchmarking can also be used to evaluate the cost effectiveness of USAID interventions when appropriate. There are also many centrally managed mechanisms that provide economic analysis and other analytic, analytical tools to improve development outcomes. I'll just speak to a few that are run out of the Bureau Center for Economics and Market Development, which is where uh, Bill, and I, Bill, Robin, and I work. This includes uh, analyses related to uh, digitalization, trade, regulation, and market development, as well as products and services that help uh, improve partner government's capacity to raise, raise revenues and provide public services in an accountable manner. The Bureau also helps build the capacity of agency staff and partners to conduct and manage analyses and to identify information gaps. For example, the Center for Economics and Market Development provide guidance documents such as USAID's employment framework and conducts trainings focused on economic growth, trade, and finance, among others. I'll close by mentioning, mentioning that the Bureau provides customized analyses and technical services when shocks like the global pandemic emerge. So the suite of tools is uh, constantly evolving as we learn more. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nathan. And throughout the session, we've been receiving a number of questions from our audience members. Thank you so much for chiming in with your thoughts and questions. I'll now uh, transition into a Q&A portion of our event. So if you have more questions, please continue to put them in the chat box below and we'll, um, we'll look through them and direct them to our panelists. So, with that, I, I was hoping to kick off with a question um, from Armenia and directing this to Bill. Um, I wonder if you could speak more about the intersection of public investment and the crowding in of the private sector and what is USA's role in all of this? That's a, that's a, great, that's a great question because uh, you know, I, I kind of touched on it but didn't uh, didn't really go into it. And it, it's a tough question because, you know, so, I mean, the model we all kind of have in mind is like East Asia, right? You know, the East Asian growth miracle. Now, a lot of that was driven by, was driven by public investment, right? Um, particularly public investment that was pretty well targeted towards a particular goal. And that was at the time it was exports, exports of goods, right? And, uh, and, and, you know, you know, the South Korea's, uh, you know, the, the Thailand, Thailand's other Saudi, more recently Vietnam, uh, you know, have done uh, Vietnam with a great amount of support from USAID, by the way, for trade capacity building. We uh, played a huge role in Vietnam success. Uh, I think we should take a little credit there um, for the explosive growth uh, in exports and, and, and uh, which led to economic growth and poverty alleviation. So those were, I think, well-targeted um, examples of what kind of more well-targeted and thought out public investments. Uh, and, uh, but it, do, it doesn't always work out, right? There's a lot, there's also lots of examples of, of poor public investments. Um, you know, a lot of countries in Africa come to mind uh, that, you know, for years have struggled with uh, endemic corruption and just poor institutions. Uh, for some reason, they just didn't have uh, the institutional uh, or the state capability or capacity to make effective public investments. And so that's something we got to look at. And that's something we got to analyze. And you know, that's part of the political economy of the state. That's so important in determining whether or not you're able to make effective public investments. 
Um, and, you know, it, it, it couldn't be public investments, I, you know, building on what um, uh, Luis was saying earlier, you know, public investments couldn't be more important today as well, especially with regards to um, climate change and uh, resilience. Uh, to economic shocks and natural disasters. I mean, these are the, these are just examples of some of the public investments that are going to continue to be um, uh, even even more important. Um, there was another there was another question about talking about what about the competing model of you know um, the competing model out there, uh, you know where a lot of money is given mainly for infrastructure, uh, you know that can lead to growing debt burdens. And so I think I think that. That absolutely goes along with what with with what we're talking about here is like you know how do we ensure that the public investments that are being made make sense? Um, you know I think the answer is are they being done transparently? Uh, as I was saying before, are they informed uh, at least at some aspect um, by democratic values? Uh, and and so you have to be very you have to be very careful. So I mean it, it, effective public investment I think is crucial for economic development. Um, we have to analyze the political economy of the state, uh, and I think we can do that. As Nathan, as Nathan just as Nathan just stated, that's something that the uh, um, uh, we don't we're not we don't really house the Center for Economics and Market Mil Development doesn't really house political economy analysis. That's DRG, but we can we can support political economy analysis as well. So can our projects, and, and I think that's absolutely something that's part of the economic analysis. That's why again part of why economic analysis is so important. Is understanding these constraints and opportunities, and where public investment makes sense, uh, and where it doesn't, uh, in order to uh, move uh, growth forward. Thanks, Bill. We also, um, speaking of, of the role of the public sector, um, we did receive quite a few questions on on um, publicly owned firms and, and other. Um, entities. And so I was going to turn this next question over to David. Um, can you speak to your thoughts on how low income countries ensure sustainable economic growth in the context of domestic financial institutions that are largely, largely publicly owned and where there are restrictions against foreign financial investments that are limiting access to finance? Um, thank you. So I mean, obviously, it's going to be a lot harder to achieve access to finance if there's not private financial institutions. But I think the approach, I, th I think the approach is still s the same. And I think that you have, there's um, financing needs of all sorts of different scale, and they need different approaches. I think it's important to work with whatever banks there are there to try to help them move away from collateral based lending to risk-based lending. So teaching them how to lend more to SMEs and assess what the risks are, the risks of repayment, rather than just looking at collateral. Uh, if I think it's also important to provide such assistance to non-bank financial institutions. Um, I also think that uh, embedded finance is something that we should look at more. That means um, within the value chains, there can be anchor firms, large anchor firms, that are buying things from small uh, suppliers. And if you can, and if they pay for that, the things they're buying long before they get them, could be agriculture, could be other things, uh, that's finance. And so you can teach large anchor firms to do, um, to do credit risk assessments and almost give them the, 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 the same skills that banks use when they're assessing loan applications. Um, and, the, and those anchor firms know those industries, whereas whereas banks don't. Uh, franchising also you can look at as a way of providing uh, finance. So I think we need to look um, across the board at commercial banks, even if they're state-owned commercial banks, non-bank financial institutions, and kind of innovative ways uh, within, within um, value chains. And then also there can be some very specific things like letters of credit and trade financing that sometimes need legal and regulatory reforms uh, that can be very targeted. Also, uh, leasing and some other very narrow, a collection of kind of narrowly focused financing methods can be uh, a, a way to make progress in such countries. Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Louise next to, to take on a few of the other questions that we've received. 
Um, Louise, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you two questions all at once. Um, one of them focused more um, on the role of um, host governments and the next one a little bit more on the EG policy itself. Um, the firstly, what surprises me most, um, this is from one of our participants, what surprises me most is the notion that partner host governments at all levels don't already know the requirements for inclusive, sustainable, and catalytic enterprise-led de development. One of the obstacles um, for our partner countries that our partner countries face is, um, is economic governance and, and corruption. And can you speak a little bit about that? And then the second question is, um, Louise, I know the economist in you is going to love this one. Um, is economic growth sustainable? Can we continue to grow indefinitely? Or are there, is there already a cap to the growth that we're seeing? Um, and what is the goal um, to, what is the, the way to optimize uh, an equitable, equitable economic state for most stakeholders? That's quite a that's quite a set of questions. Wow. Let me start with the first one. And I think that what I want to go back to is the point that um, Bill made that um, economics is a system and economic growth takes the whole economic system to work. I think cor and corruption is I'm not endorsing corruption. Don't get me wrong, but corruption is not the only obstacle to economic growth. And indeed, if you look at the history of economic development, you can cite several countries that have grown rapidly and sustainably as they gradually dealt with their corruption issues. One I might cite is Korea, which used to be a quite corrupt country um, in, in the 60s, for sure. Um, you know, there are others that I could cite in Latin America, for example. Um, Chile used to be quite corrupt. It's and now it's a, a high income country and it's dealt with quite a bit of its uh, corruption. Um, so I guess um, I think you need to growth is complex and it takes the whole system. It takes infrastructure. It takes knowledge. Uh, including management knowledge and technical knowledge. It takes, for example, we were just talking about the financial sector. It takes payment systems. That's not about corruption. That's about a, a financial infrastructure that's needed in order to deepen the financial sector and, and make the cost of credit uh, cheaper. Um, it needs agriculture. Agriculture undergirds um, all economic transformation. So we can't just say, oh, it's if, if everybody fixed corruption, we'd have growth. No, I don't think so. We still need uh, a lot more, a lot more. Um, and we can still fix some problems while other problems are, you know, lagging and where uh, efforts on those problems um, are lagging. So that's what I would say uh, about corruption. Now on sustainability. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of economic history. So before the Industrial Revolution, economic growth was not sustainable and countries would grow and then um, they would have that, that was sort of the Malthusian trap. Something would happen, uh, disease, famine, disaster, whatever. And basically the innovations of the first, second and third uh, industrial revolutions, that's sort of a steam, uh, electricity and digital have really um, allowed growth to be sustainable and they've allowed major increases in per capita income around the world, but especially of course, in today's rich countries like the US, right? So we need to continue to have major increases in economic growth. The population is increasing and we cannot, if we don't have increases in economic growth, um, that the incomes of that population uh, will suffer. So how do we do that? Again, innovation and investment are key. Um, Okay, farmland. Do we have enough farmland? Well, today we have some unused farmland in Africa, which can be used, but we can, yields can rise. Yields have risen on farms, how much you grow per, per acre of land, and yields can continue to increase all over the world, uh, you know, with investment and technology. Water, are we running out of water? Well, uh, possibly, but water can be saved. Water can be reused uh, it, it, once it's, and water 
we can develop technologies to use less water. I mean, after all, drip irrigation, what's that about using less water? Um, and it's allowed the desert to bloom, for example, those kinds of technologies. Um, and so we can have more density uh, in our cities. We don't have to have these spread out cities. We're gonna have more density. And if we have more density, then we use, uh, need less uh, transportation infrastructure and we can uh, be less polluting. And cities in general are actually, uh, 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 not a well-known fact, cities are actually less uh, polluting um, than people living in, in rural areas, uh, per capita, that is, and they use less energy per capita. And so I think it's important for us to think about the role of urbanization in making growth um, sustainable. Um, so I think uh, maybe I'll stop there um and we'll see what other questions come in thanks so much louise i know i just threw a lot of questions at you so i'm going to um turn it over to liz now liz you spoke a little bit about um elements like inclusion and human rights in the eg policy and also how they apply to your work at ide um, i'm wondering if you can talk about linking specifically human rights um, and inclusion principles with market systems development approach. Yeah, thanks, Davey. Um, specifically, as it relates to WASH, I'll give two, two different examples. One is in Nepal. Um, access to water is a basic human right, and we want to make sure people have that not only for health reasons, but also for productive reasons as it intersects with agriculture. So in Nepal, one of the approaches that, that we've used that helps to make this possible is a multiple use water system. Um, Nepal, for those of you who are familiar with it, is incredibly hilly, and so it requires the um, active participation of communities that are both higher up and lower down in order to ensure that both communities can access water. Um, in Nepal, we do quite a bit of work with Dalit communities in the hills and by um, using a multiple use water system, which I'll explain is designed from the very beginning for both household water use as well as productive agriculture use, we're able to create a sustainable model because the income that's generated from the productive use of the water for agriculture goes to the operations and maintenance of the um, multiple use water system so that communities can continue to access um, drinking water as well as water for agriculture. So that's that's one example of ensuring you have cooperation amongst the community, you have a system that continues to be invested in and sustained at a community level. Um, when it gets to broader market systems approaches as well, um, the approach that we use in Cambodia, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Nepal, and Ghana is sanitation marketing. So we are drumming up both the demand and the supply side for the production of latrines so that families can access safe and affordable quality latrines, which has the intersection, of course, with um, health because diarrhea, as many of you know, is the number one killer of children under the age of five. Um, due to lack of access to sanitation. So what we've done in, in Cambodia, where we first started and where we're now partnering with USAID with the world's first development impact bond, is we have helped to move sanitation in the country prior to the development impact bond from 23% to 72%. And now with the development impact bond with USAID, we're looking to take that to 100%. And we do that by helping to design and prototype um, latrine businesses that are, you know, concrete manufacturers that existed beforehand and adding another line onto their business of selling latrines and then using a rural sales force going out into households and communities to um, give them the opportunity to purchase um, a latrine at an affordable, a reasonable price that is also paired with microfinance so that they can uptake on the latrines and also understanding kind of the cost of not solving the problem of healthy sanitation for their families, for the girls and the women who have to go out into the fields at night where it's not safe um, and 
it really makes a huge difference. So I think there are definitely ways to bring in basic human rights, like access to water, access to sanitation within a market system, which helps to ensure that it is sustainable for the long term. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, we're continuing to get a lot of questions in, so I'm, I'm trying to parse through them. Um, I'm gonna direct the next one to Nathan. Um, since you talked a little bit about economic analysis, um, relative to the MCC, World Bank, and other donor agencies, USA's own internal rules and guidances require far less economic analysis throughout our program cycle. It is encouraged, but not always required. Should we be more forward leaning on this? Thanks, Debbie. Uh, and I think this is an excellent question. Um, in my mind, there are you know, three kind of broad approaches that we can use to be more forward-looking uh, with integrating economic analysis and project design and implementation. Um, the first is you know, ease of use. Um, so there are a lot of people out there that work in missions who you know, work in different sectors or are you know, busy with annual reporting requirements and, and other things uh, that are you know, part of the day-to-day you know, operations of, of running a, an overseas mission. So, um, and by ease of use, I mean, make it easier to know what resources are out there and how economic analysis can be tied into USAID's missions, uh, the USAID mission's economic growth portfolio. Um, so in support of this, uh, you know, our uh, center, the Center for Economics and Market Development have uh, developed a draft mission order um, that has the, the resources, the type of analysis that can be integrated to different parts of the program cycle um, the uh, points of contact that can be uh, you know, reached out to to perform these analyses. Um, and then the, the mission orders can be given to uh, USAID overseas missions and they can adapt it to their needs and it can be you know, enforced or promoted by uh, the respective program offices. Um, so that's one way. Another way is to in integrate economic analyses into um, you know, grants and contracts. And so um, you know, if, if this is something that is uh, you know, integrated at the beginning of a, of a project or an activity um, and it's used throughout the program cycle, then it has the ability to inform, um, you know, the activities and to prove development outcomes. The example that comes to mind is the Hinga Wizi, uh agriculture uh, project in uh, Rwanda. And so there the um, implementing partner has embraced uh, economic analysis and specifically cost benefit analysis. And it's been integrated and conducted for their major investments to include uh, irrigation systems, um, and then uh, you know to finance into to other uh, important areas of their uh, their projects. So that would be the second one: is to integrate uh, economic analysis uh, early and often into the the project design documents and everything else. And then finally, um, you do have um, this kind of third area, which is to push for um, more requirements to conduct analyses. And I'm not going to advocate for that because that's it would be on my pay grade. Um, but there is you know, a case to be made there. And I say that well, the one example that we have is that uh, you know, ABS uh, 201 has just been passed, which requires that all impact evaluations include uh, a cost analysis. Um, so I would say the third and final area is to, um, you know, to, to research what requirements, you know, other agencies use, and then, um, you know, that could be a potential avenue for, for pushing for additional analysis. Uh, but once again, that's, that's a tricky one. So thank you. Thanks, Nathan. We received a, a few other questions um, while you were speaking on um, the role of implementing partners. And this was, I think, directed to Bill, but I'm actually going to turn it over to perhaps Liz, David, or Louise, um, we would love to hear your thoughts on how the implementing partner um, community can promote programming that includes the forest to be um, economically included. David, I missed one of the words in there. Um, what was it before uh, to be economically included? Um, how the we can be how the implementing partner community can be um, considering the the poorest of the poor um, in, when thinking about economic growth, essentially. 
I'm happy to start on that question and would welcome additional comments from David or Louise, but um, that's exactly where, where we start all of our work is with the most economically vulnerable. And I can tell you from years of experience that you can drive economic growth um, with the most economically uh, vulnerable. Um, I loved Louise's comment earlier that agriculture undergirds all economic transformation, and we have found that to be absolutely true. Um, that is the first place where you really can start, because a lot of the countries where you have um, the most vulnerable, you tend to have agricultural basis there. So um, starting with how are people currently making money? whatever level at which they're making money and how do you increase that? Um, so if it's agriculture, you're looking at yields. How do you increase yields or how do you increase expansion onto a diff, diff, uh, additional arable land? Um, if it's through trading, it's what is being, what is most popular in the market at this time? How do you increase um, additional levels of trading? But really agriculture is, is a, extremely strong base for just getting started and starting to change the trajectory of lives. Um, Louise also mentioned water, which I'm happy to talk about because we also do quite a bit of work around drip irrigation. And if you have farmers who are typically dependent on rain fed crops, if you can access groundwater, if you can use drip irrigation to conserve, you can grow two or three crop cycles a year that automatically doubles and triples incomes of households who are living um, right on the margins. So pass over to either Louise or David, if either of you want to add more to that. I would say one thing which I want to underscore what uh, Bill has said and Robin also. Um, if you start at the beginning uh, with an economic analysis, and that economic analysis looks not only at growth, the growth pattern, but whether it's been inclusive and why or why not. And then you build your strategy using that analysis. Then you will be uh, developing projects that include uh, the poorest and most vulnerable. Because after all, the, the question um, to the implementing partners is, we decided to go in this direction. Uh, please submit a proposal um, to figure out how to go in that direction. But in order to figure out how to go in that direction, you have to have done your overall growth analysis and looking at inclusivity and looking at who's left behind and why or why not and to what extent um, economic growth can be part of the solution. That's the big picture. I, I would just echo those ideas and say that the overall idea is don't just look at the averages, look at the different, the group, different groups in society. So if you're looking at what I was just talking about, access to finance. Don't just look at the big commercial banks that are only lending to the large companies. Look at non-bank financial institutions and, and, in, and embedded value chains that can lend to small lenders. Uh, don't just look at, at, at men, look at and who might be the dominant group in a certain uh, area, but look at women as well. So for instance, if uh, a labor law um, imposes particularly high costs of hiring employees, for part-time uh, workers and women are predominantly part-time workers, then that's going to particularly hurt uh, women. And so you need to not just change the labor law for everyone, but look at part-time workers. So think about what the marginalized com communities are and, and segregate by gender and see how the, the various policies affect those specific communities. Thanks, everyone. I know that we have a lot more questions to get through. Um, we probably don't have time to go through all of them, um, but I know that we are tracking all of your questions from our audience members, and we will do our best to attempt to answer them via blogs and other formats through market links throughout the month. So please look out for, for some of the answers there as well. Um, before we, we wrap up the session, we've heard a lot about the EG policy and, and all of the avenues um, in which it can go. Um, it's, it's been a lot for me to take in personally, and, and I wondered, Louise, can you help us think about how we can bring all of this together, and, and what are your thoughts for what makes for a good development practice? Uh, 
Uh, sure. And I'll come back. Thanks, Debbie. And I'll come back to the topic that we were just discussing about inclusive growth. You know, the definite, what is the definition of economic development? It's about sustainably raising the welfare of the population. That's everybody. That's not just a few. Okay. The whole population, not just a narrow elite that's grabbed uh, power. And you know, economic growth is a necessary condition for economic development, but it doesn't ensure it. And the objective of the economic analysis done and the EG policy is economic development. And uh, enterprise-driven growth is the means, but the outcome needs to be economic um, development, okay? And most people, right? Work their, way, work their way out of poverty. That means through a job, through what they work. And so the question is, how can we make them more productive, greater earnings, and uh, more secure earnings? And that's really what an economic growth strategy does, is it really looks at that question. And so all growth requires improvements in productivity, which requires investment, which requires a continual surplus of resources, and which means saving. So economic growth policy has to look at savings. And but growth itself generates that surplus. So people were saying, is economic growth sustainable for the whole planet? Yes. Not only is it sustainable, it's needed so that we can get the surplus and keep investing and keep uh, innovating and keep developing. And so, um, so supporting inclusive economic growth is supporting good development. That's really the thought that I want to uh, leave you with. Um, now, uh, I know Chris followed up on governance and on corruption and said, but shouldn't we um, shine a light on it, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely, Chris. And, and everything USA does in governance, a lot of that is trying to do that. And accountability is what fights corruption. Accountability. And every country, every country. And so definitely economic growth be the only right USA it's toolkit. My real point is you can't say, well, because we've got this problem over here and it's very severe, we can't do anything. And that's my point. There's always something uh, in almost every country. I mean, we can make exceptions, but um, there's always something that can be done if you can find um, that area in which um, our economic advice and the government's uh, uh, directions and where the government wants to go um, uh, overlap. And then that's where we program, right? Um, so, but we also have to understand what are the constraints to our programming succeeding, including um, things like corruption. So I think, um, you know, I think I would conclude again to say, economists don't always agree. I don't know if that's news to you, but they don't always agree. And they don't always agree about the hows to get inclusive growth. Uh, there are certainly debates in Africa where I've done a lot of work about industrialization versus services. You know, uh, can we help smallholder farmers? Is that a waste of money? Do we just need commercial farmers, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are debates about what policy mix is needed at what point in time. But what I can tell you is not under discussion or in debate is that the most efficient economic structure in the world is the modern productivity driven enterprise. And that's why we start in the EG policy with enterprise driven growth. And that's why I like the EG policy is it highlights this foundation, right, for economic development and transformation. And so that's why good development practice requires uh, this economic um, uh, analysis. All right. So as the policy takes pains to point out, that doesn't mean that either USAID or partner governments should make the investment in, in these enterprises directly. Private investment is what drives growth. What public investment needs to do is make the conditions exist to reduce the risk and raise the returns so that that investment comes in, as well as to help gather the savings and intermediate them effectively uh, through the financial sector. And so that's why before undertaking a project in any sector, 
USAID should adequately identify the economic obstacles to private investment. So that's how I would kind of um, wrap things up, uh, Debbie. Did I leave anything um, behind or will that do? I think you covered quite a lot, Louise. So thank you so much for, for doing so. I also, I, I know that um, that's only part of the discussion for this morning. So I wondered if David, Liz, uh, Bill, Nathan, if you have any closing thoughts to offer to add on to what Louise shared with us. I would just add uh, the following closing thoughts. I think that there's a paradox in the politics of international uh, development that Republican administrations tend to be less enthusiastic about international development, but within that they really get why economic growth is important and democratic administrations are the opposite. They're very enthusiastic about uh, foreign assistance, but a little bit skeptical of economic growth. And to be uh, just clear where my allegiances lie, my very first job out of college was working as a legislative correspondent on Capitol Hill for then Senator Joe Biden, uh, at, uh, answering constituent letters on and explaining his views on economic growth. So I'm very enthusiastic about the current administration, but I still think in any democratic administration, we have to explain why economic growth is important and getting to what Bill said, uh, that it's not just about laissez-faire, let the private market do what it wants, that in fact, economic, good economic policies and good economic governance are everything for achieving all of our development outcomes. I thought Administrator Power did a great job of this in her opening remarks after being sworn in, where she talked about how domestic resource mobilization is important because that's how you have raised the money to pay for healthcare costs and all the other development objectives that we have. And I think that the economic growth strategy is also really important in this, in this area. The economic growth strategy is not an encyclopedia of everything that you should do to provide assistance in trade facilitation or et cetera. What it's really good at is explaining the story. Why, why, why is, what is the connection between economic growth programming and all the things we're trying to achieve? Thanks, David. Liz, Nathan, Bill, any final thoughts from you? Um, I'm happy to add something, Davy. I just want to re-emphasize the, the thought and um, attention that has gone into the development of the principles as an implementing partner that is focused on economic growth. Uh, it is everything that we do. Um, we're really encouraged by how this has been distilled within the policy and also how it can be used to encourage growth in partnership with host governments. Um, and personally, I'm just really excited um, about the focus on cost effective. We have limited resources within um, international development and we need to make sure that all of the work that is being done is the most cost effective possible to get the results. And as the um, burden or the opportunity shifts to host governments, that will become even more important because we'll have fewer resources that are focused um, in that initial stage of transfer where we, we really need to ensure that every dollar that is going into programming is resulting in the development outcomes that we're looking for. And economic growth is the basis of all of that to ensure that we can really help to transform uh, countries around the world. Thanks, Lance. I realize that we could probably talk for another hour and a half about the EG policy if we really wanted to, but I'm going to close it here, um, just noting the time, and wanted to thank all of our panelists today for sharing your thoughts on the EG policy, especially as it relates to the implementation of it in the field. And thanks also to all of our audience members for joining us today, for staying all the way through the end and for sharing your thoughts and comments on the policy. Um, I know that we'll be reviewing the questions and comments that you've been sharing with us. And as I mentioned, we will probably be turning a few of them into blog posts on market links. So please look out for that. Um, I also wanted to remind all of you that since the session is recorded, we can we will have this posted on market links in the coming days. So all of you can revisit the, the event. You can share it with your friends. I, I really hope you do. 
Um, and you can also continue to share your own thoughts by becoming a member of Market Links today. It's a free membership. And uh, as soon as you're a member, you can go ahead and, and share your thoughts via blogs and other resources from your organizations as well. So I really um, encourage you to do so. Before I, I leave um, you all today, I wanted to also encourage you to take our exit poll, which will be appearing on the screen shortly. And again, really appreciate all, everyone's engagement today uh, and thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you, Davey. Thank you, everyone. In just a few moments, you'll see the exit poll appear on your screen. We will also share an image uh, on our exit layout that will show you and invite you to please share some written responses into chat, uh, just kind of explaining how can USAID help your organization operationalize the economic growth policy, and what additional comments or questions do you have for our panelists? Uh, as Davy said, any questions or comments that have been submitted that were not addressed in today's session will be uh, included as a follow-up either in a blog post or uh, depending on the question there will be a specific type of follow-up so with that being said thank you for answering your exit polls and the uh, exit layout will appear on your screen shortly bye everyone hi everyone and it was thank really you. nice it was yep. really nice to be with you today Thanks all the panelists. Thanks all. Liz, David, really good stuff. Thank you for the opportunity. Yep. Thanks so much, great job. Here we go. And we now have posted uh, what to share in chat before you do leave us for the day. And we do hope you have a great rest of your day, morning, evening, wherever your feet may find you. Thank you, my friend. If you are still in the room, we do invite you to answer into chat any last minute thoughts you might have. Uh, if we will leave the room open for another few minutes so that we can solicit those responses. And you will see that the, after a few minutes, the room will close. And we do thank you for your participation today.
Thank you, my friends. We are now going to be closing this room. So you may exit out of this application as you would any other web browser. Have a great day.